I am unashamed. What about you? So we, uh, Jace is still, you know, in in the, on the road. He's out getting some stories. We send him out, Mom, every once in a while to get stories for us. No, you send him out because you're tired of his mouth. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> that, that too. Because <laughs> we had a, the last podcast was just Dad and I said, well, Dad, what, how about that without Jace? And Dad's a very peaceful. <laughs> it's a lot more peaceful. Uh, but no, we miss Jace when he's here. I can't wait for him to get back because he's going to have some stories. Oh. But so in his, in the, in this place, because yesterday we had on, um, we had on uh, Martin and Godwin which first time Martin had ever been on Stone and the, the Nurse Man. And we had Stone and the Nurse Man, which was interesting as well. Mm-hmm. You know Nurse Man well because he's um, he helped you with some care of, of me. He's helped you with your various ailments, as Dad yeah. said. And accidents. So so <laughs> we officially we're welcoming mom, Miss Kay and Lisa, uh, my better <laughs> half. So I, I was just telling Dad uh before you guys uh came on that um according to our analytics person the the most viewed podcast of all these, which we're, we're up to where are we at, Josh? 368, 69. <clears throat> so the most viewed podcast was the last time we had you two on, over 4 Ooh. million views. So apparently when we bring beauty into the uh, unashamed lair, uh, the views pick up, Dad. So I, I guess something better to look at maybe. They Is wanted that? to hear what the women had to say. That's right. Because they they they're listening to what we're saying. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know about all that. <laughs> Which is what you said, Stone said when he came into the world, right? I don't know yeah. about all that. I, I think they um, they just think there's no telling what the women are going to say. Well, that's true. So I think I think they like that, Kay. Yeah, Phil yeah. said I always talk. Well, we too get much. a lot of good uh, when Missy <laughs> comes on. We get a lot of that too because she. She likes to refute Jace, and so oh. the audience loves that, somebody yeah. willing to take him I'm, up. I was just saying from from observation that when Stone's head <laughs> protruded from the wound <laughs> and he looked around, his first thought was, I don't know about all this. <laughs> <laughs> and Jace maybe too, right? I yeah. don't know. You uh, you were there, Mom, but it sounds like something he would say. Well, too. he came out crying and throwing a fit, and he's been doing it so to Mom, me So, Mom, since. you're going to love this. I had to say this. So I read, you remember the letter I showed you that I wrote when I was six years old to Nanny? Yeah. Who's your grandmother, who right. you talk about a lot. So in the letter, I said, Jace is really mean, mm-hmm. but I guess that's how little brothers are. But I made the point to Jace that he was not even two. It was in June when the he, charge was when made. the charge was made. <laughs> the right. the man was not even two years old, and I'm commenting on his mean demeanor. So you know, what I told him, I said, "Mom was has been vindicated." She said, "All these years she couldn't get along with Jace. It was vindicated by your six year old son, me. Right? That he really was a handful. It was two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I heard a little whine, and I said." <laughs> What is that? And it sounded like an animal with a whine. So I got up. I remember, don't Walked you know? out yeah. there, and I said, but it's outside. So I walked outside in the yard. I went to a, underneath the house. There was just a block there, you know, <coughs> open spot, you know, about three feet. <coughs> and, and I finally got to there and had a flashlight, and I shined my light up in there. And there's Jace. He was about two or three years old. He was about two. Two, three. It's right along this time. There's Jay sitting there whining. I'm like, <laughs> Jace, what are you doing? <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, the dog was under there with him. Duchess. Yep. We had Duchess yep. back yep. then. And she was looking out for yeah, him. Yeah, she was. Because that's what kind of dog she was. But he had gotten out of the house somehow and gotten up underneath so He walked in his sleep or something. Yeah. Which he had a little, there was a little bit of sleepwalking back in the day, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Any kind of trouble he could cause, he would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know he was little and probably asleep, but. So, so, Mom, a couple of things. So, because uh, I still get people asking me about how you're doing. Obviously, Dad mentioned that you haven't had anything done to your lips, but they look amazing. So, you've totally healed from your Bobo incident early, earlier this year. That's right. And it was a shock because actually, when I went in that night and I looked so bad, and you can verify that, right, Phil? I mean, it was like I looked like a monster. But the surgeon who came in at the St. Francis emergency room said, Miss Kay, you're going to be shocked 
how well these lips will heal. And I, I thought he's just trying to make me feel good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, but I, I was in such shock. You know, I never even cried with all that. I wasn't, I, I didn't no cry. cry. And it was like I was really in some kind of shock. And but I it's thought, not every night that you, you, someone shakes you at 11.30, about 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. And I looked up and she's standing there and she said, you, you might have to take me to the doctor. And I'm looking. I said her, the hospital. Yeah, the hospital. I'm looking at her lips and they're just chewed up by yeah. a dog. I mean, well, I couldn't know, take the I mean, towel splits away. that were like Blood a half somewhere. inch. And yeah. it's lips are parted and chunks gone. And so I'm looking at her now, you know. And uh, I said, I figured Botox would do it, but <laughs> she broke out the old Maybelline and there pulled it go. off. Pulled it off. Uh -huh. Natural beauty, Mom. I don't know. That was miraculous healing, I think. I really do. It was great. I well, couldn't one, believe it. One thing about you, Mom, is you're resilient. Yeah, yeah. You How a, many accidents have I really yeah. had? <laughs> when you got back from your last trip, I was like, okay, did you get hurt? I mean, my first question is, where did you get hurt? I got hurt the day before I left, the day of the trip. I fell down and bruised my left knee really <laughs> bad. And I didn't even tell Phil <laughs> because I thought maybe it'll be healed by the time I get home. Yeah. So That's I was all right till I got on my all fours to get out of that bathtub, up the little bitty bathtub. And then I realized that one of my all fours wouldn't work. I couldn't put it down. So you're on all threes. All three kneecaps. Tripod. That's pretty yeah. bad when you're trying like to get a dog that's got a hurt leg. Right. You're trying to get around on all threes. That's not good, man. Well, I you never got out of the bathtub. It's embarrassing. Well, the old adage, oh. let a sleeping dog lie. Oh. That's right. But she learned a valuable lesson there. She, you know? she just leaned over mm -hmm. Bobo to say, we're well, going to see you in the morning. So, so that's my question. Do you ever kiss them anymore good night or did that? that when they're fully awake. <laughs> so you're still kissing. You're still I still kiss him good night, but I mean, I say, Bobo, Bobo. <laughs> And he looks up at me. <laughs> and then I say, well. Wake him up you before wake you him say up, goodbye. Guess, uh, you know what? That reminds me. Remember when Granny was at our house one time? And uh, we had the big, huge bathtub. I think this is when we lived on um, on Wellspring by John and Paula. And uh, and so we put some bubbles in there because she wanted to do a bubble bath. But then she could not get uh, out of the bathtub because yeah. it was too slick. Yeah. So we had to drain the water and then put towels on the bottom so that she could actually get out of. You remember when she did that when she stayed with us uh, a couple of days? If I did, it's so traumatic now. I'm, I yeah. blocked it out of my mind. You don't want to see your grandmother in the bathtub trying yeah. to help her get well, out. Well, that's true. <laughs> so well, whatever your memory of that is, I, I'm blocked out if I was helping. Well, officers. I can totally relate to every bit of that. <laughs> yeah. Every bit of it. Well, it might have been you. Was it you or was it? It granny. was probably me. <laughs> well, Granny stayed with us for a couple of nights. I was thinking it was Granny because oh, Alan, I bet you Alan money would not me. come in the bathroom. I'm like, well, I don't know how to get her out of the bathroom. I mean, she was a pretty large woman, <laughs> but we used to live with them. You remember when we, Lisa and I first got married, we didn't have any place to live yet because that kind of sped up the, you know, we were, uh, Dad, the way I put it now is that our biology was beginning to overtake our theology because we were trying to remain pure until we got married, but it was, you know, difficult. And so we kind of moved the wedding date up a little bit. So we didn't really quite have our housing situation set up. So we, we lived the first six months in the front bedroom at Granny and Paul's house, which was next door to, to you guys. Yeah. And so Lisa and I, so we would lay in there. We, every night before we would go to sleep, we would laugh hysterically at listening to them dueling snore. Because, you know, Pa had like a, you know, kind of a smoker snore, you know, and then Granny kind of had a high pitch. Wee, 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 wee. So it would be, oh, so, so you remember that? But, I've noticed two yeah. things that develop <clears throat> out of age between the husband and the wife. I've noticed two things. In my particular case, going into the 70s, I've become quieter. Miss Kay has become louder. 
<laughs> well, I finally got to talk after all these years. Now, I don't know the meaning of behind it, but I'm much quieter. I think you found your roar, okay? <clears throat> I did. Mm-hmm. That's true. I did. So Lisa and I, we lived there six months, and then the there was a camp on the other side. We'd been trying to buy it. Dad had been trying to buy it, and then, and then we were married, so we were trying to buy it. It's a little two-room, really kind of just a shack, but it was a camp. No bathroom. It had an outdoor bathroom still out back, which there's no telling what was living in there because that's mm. wooded. And um, but the guy would not turn loose. He um, he lived in town. He worked at the mill, and he liked to come out here and fish, you know. And uh, so he uh, so we kept asking him, "No, I'm not interested in selling it." And so we mm. kept living there, trying to figure out what we we're going to do because we wanted to live down here. I was working for the company at the time, although that's. Loose term working because mm. we weren't really holding ma- your checks. Yeah, we weren't making any money, and uh, but so this um, finally this guy's wife comes. She never hardly ever came with him, but she came with him one weekend, and she went in there and she sat out on a chair, and she said she just felt weird about it, like something was going on. So she she picked the cushion up on that chair. Of course, this thing again stays empty most of the time, and it's in the woods, which is where <clears> y'all are. And she lifted up that seat cushion. And there was a big old chicken snake Ooh. that was underneath that seat cushion. And, of course, you know, they're they're a bad-looking ombre. They won't really hurt you, but they're about six foot long. Non-poisonous. Non-poisonous. <clears throat> but they look, they look bad. And she saw that big old thing curled up. And she hit the front door of that thing. And, and the way her husband described it, she never worried about the steps. <laughs> she just took a big leap right out the front door, <laughs> rolled about three times, got in the vehicle and told him in not in a bunch Sell of, Sell it. Yeah. in a bunch of blankety blank terms. I am never coming back to this place. And so he came over and told dad, he was like, well, I guess I am selling the place because she's never coming back. After well, that. God works in mysterious ways. He That's did. Right. He 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 planted, and you know, all the years we lived there, I never we never had a snake in the house. We yeah. had a few varmints, but never yeah. a snake. Now it's a little house full of well, how shall I call <laughs> <it>? treasures? <laughs> treasures. I mean, treasures. I opened the door about a couple of months ago, and I looked in there. I said, "What in the world?" But I just noticed the 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 most, uh, the biggest thing there were books. Yeah, a lot of books. books. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, ch- children, thousands, thousands <laughs> of children's children's books. Uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a library. It's a library. It's a library. I have my own library. And after we're gone, Miss Kay, I don't know whoever walks out there and says, "What? What do we do with this thing?" I'm well, thinking, nobody will burn books; they'll give them more. No, I'm thinking by this time the black mold and everything else will be set in. So I'm thinking diesel <clears throat> and a well placed match may be the way to send your life. No, because you're going to set the trees on fire. You don't want to burn up trees. <laughs> well, I guess you're right. We have to just tear it down. But anyway, so we we. Uh, let we, Willie do it. He loves to tear By the way, He's right there where the, where the houses are, and that <clears> old house that y'all lived in, and we call it the warehouse. Then there's a trailer house, and for guests, <laughs> then there's just a, <laughs> then there's a just a catch all. <laughs> I mean, but if you look at it all, that's the it's underneath. That's virgin timber. Yeah. That those trees out there are hundreds of years old. Yeah, those big old pine it's trees. It's amazing that. You know, from time to time, the hurricanes that come up through here, you know, mm-hmm. we'll get 75 mile an hour wind. Uh, the last time we had one, Laura, I think was the name of that one. Yep. It was the two that came by, one come up, then another one yep, followed two it. Well. And that second one uh, knocked down a lot of trees. But amazingly, right there <clears> where we were with all that, the, where we live and all, yeah. uh, one went down, but it went down at the only place it could go without no. tearing tearing power lines down or hitting on the house. But uh, that's the last close call we've had. But amazingly, none of the big trees have fallen. I mean, listen, there's some pine trees there. They are really gigantic. Oh, yeah, I've been there a long time. So let's take a break. So one of our longest running sponsors, uh, and I've always kind of chuckled every time that we talk about them on the podcast, is a, is a company called Keeps.com. And what's funny to me is that Robertson men are known for hair, whether it be of the beard variety, you know, the long hair, the the bandanas, the whole look. And yet 
there's a lot of guys, obviously, that uh, have to deal with uh, male pattern baldness, and so they got to do something about it. And we've got Dan, you know, who's a uh, he went by, he'd started going bald, he just peeled it off. He's been peeled for good, right? So if we'd only known that there was this company, we might could have saved Dan's hair way back when. So oh, they have a, a recommended FDA approved hair treatment. Uh, it, they're generic versions. You're only going to pay about half the cost of what you would pay somewhere else. So you want to check these guys out. Uh, it's going to ship straight to your door. Um, they're going to you go online. They're going to connect you with a doctor, make sure you're, you know, can do everything the right way. So it's keeps.com, K E E P S.com slash door. And you're going to get half off your first order. So it's a really good deal. Half off, 50% off your first order for hair loss treatments. That's keeps.com slash door, K E E P S.com slash door. So, Dad, I was going to ask you that. How many, so since we moved, we moved down here in 76. So that's been 45 years ago Mm -hmm. is how long we've been at that place. So how many trees have we lost either through lightning strike or just one got to look like it might fall on the house? How many of those big trees you're talking about have we cut over the 45 years Uh, around your house and on the property? Not many. Eight to ten. Eight to ten, yeah. I won't cut them, and everybody comes by, they say, man, these trees, if they ever fall, they're going – because some of them, you know, I mean, 100 footers, 150 feet. I mean, they are like gigantic. Yeah. It's the prettiest – old pine trees and some of them bull oaks it's just huge i can still remember when i was a little kid and we first moved here and there used to be about four right in front of the where you looked out the front door well and- look since you brought that up i looked over there and when we first got the house and i walked out there on the porch you know and looked around and i saw a little tree about oh it was about a two foot, foot a foot and a half it was like a, about like this right here. Just a little sapling. Yeah, it was just sitting there. Well, I walked out the other day and I looked at that. Well, now it's an elm tree, and elms they grow slow, slow, but it's an elm. And look, it it's now a pretty good size tree. Size tree. Yes, it's like <clears throat> this now, and you'll stand up there, you know. But I remember when it was a little sapling. I said, "That's an elm tree. I'm gonna let that one grow." Yeah, 45 so, years. 45 years. There's a pine tree out there that was about six feet tall when we moved in there. And now it's 60, 70 feet tall. You know, it went from like about like this. It's about it's about like this now. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big pine tree. Well, Lisa and I were noticing that driving out here today because they're clear cutting a bunch of yeah. area in between here and town. I saw them plant all those pines. That's what I was telling her. And that was what, 30, 25, 30? About 30. Yeah. So it's twice in our lifetime that we're seeing that area clear cut. Because, you know, you don't get to see it very often. That's right. You know, through the years. I've got a story to tell. Tell us a story, Mom. Okay. When we moved down there and went to look at the place, and I loved it, you know, everything about it. Well, I went over there to the side where the clothesline used to be, You were in between our house and the Blue House. Yep. And uh, it when we first saw it, I went over there, and there was a little magnolia tree. And I was so excited. I said, oh, my goodness, I've always wanted a magnolia tree. So then I went to tell Phil about it and all there. And then I came back out there, and Willie was out there. And all of a sudden, that tree wasn't there anymore. And he was over there chopping, (laughs) chopping, chopping. He cut. I, he cut the tree down. <laughs> I mean, how old was he? I mean, he was he, young. He's about, I know. Eight. About well, I less said, than that, probably. I said, "What made?" He's about you? five. Yeah, and I said, "What made you do that?" He said, "I didn't like it." <laughs> I said, "Well, you're fixing to get a whipping for what you didn't like because I loved it." Can you imagine now what that big magnolia would look like? Because that was forty plus oh, years ago. Bull. It'd be a huge tree now. I you can know, that, still uh, whip it. That house, uh, Jay spot, he and Missy. Uh, there was a there's a magnolia there, and uh, that thing is huge. Yeah, big magnolia. It's it's they the the house was built in seventeen. 17- 90 or something. Oh, it's, yeah. It's one of the oldest houses. Oh, yeah. You're talking I about I think the, it's the oldest <coughs> house in Washington. Yeah, Washington. River House. Yeah. It is the oldest house in Washington Parish. Yeah. 1798 yep. was and when that they started. Magnolia trees there. Yeah. They had a little damage on the 75 mile hour wind. Right. You know, it's a kind of a little pecan grove, but that's a large magnolia tree right there. So when Lisa and I were up in uh, Massachusetts, we were, you know, we talk about 1798, the oldest 
beginning structure in our entire parish up there, that's about a medium. I mean, you know, you go, you, there was things built in 16, whatever. Oh, we're yeah. at Plymouth rock, which was what 1604 or whatever it was when they came in, they still got that first rock. Yeah. Did y'all go look at their writings to where the, where they settled the Plymouth rocket? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was, it was, it was someone very said, uh, told me one of the brothers said <laughs> it, it, it was us. It yeah, was, it was the kingdom of God. Well, they had the old guy there, you know, the captain, whatever his name is, the main guy, but he was a preacher. You know, I mean, it was very much based in spiritual, which is why there's so many uh, church buildings. Mm-hmm. They're all over the place. How many mm-hmm. were there in a row, babe, on the way when we spoke? There were three. There was, three there was straight? about, no, on that strip of road we were on, there was seven or eight churches. Just There was two side by side. Right. Were there yeah. any people going to them? No, very uh, few. Very few. And yeah. that's the difference. I mean, there, it's it's it was really like Europe, where yeah. you had these great old places, mm-hmm. and when you, you go in, it, them. it's fascinating to look at them. The but old, that's all they do is go look at. I know them. it's not good. Yeah. It's our roots, but they they forgot them. They forgot them. Mm-hmm. But you know, I was saying that about. I think we mentioned it on the podcast yesterday, but I, I was saying that about Boston itself because Lisa and I had never been. So when we were hearing all these stories of the early patriots and what they did you know, to get out of the tyranny. I mean, I'm just like, I'm ready to go, you know, jump into battle somewhere because it inspired me. I was like, man, look what our founding fathers did, you know, yeah. and look, they were doing it charges of treason and you know, oh, they were going to yeah. kill them and all this stuff. And I thought this is right here in the middle of this city and this, everybody surrounding it. They've just, they've kind of just forgotten that or something. I, I, it just doesn't seem to mean anything to it. They talk about them being slave owners and this, that, and the other, and just want to just trash your own history. But when you hear the stories you know, about Paul Revere and some of the stuff that happened, it's like, it's pretty incredible. We're in the book of Matthew, and when Jesus came, they had trouble with him. That's right. And you forget. These nations, these empires, they'll <laughs> rise when they fear him, and then they say, nah. Forget him. That's right. Forget God. Well, yeah. then, that's that's we we've made a turn. Al. That's exactly right. Well, it was pretty sad for us. Hard but, times are on the way, America. Hard, hard times. But it was also encouraging because the ones who came were super blessed that we mm-hmm. came. Yeah. You know, they were just like, oh, thank y'all so much for coming here because they're not used to people making the effort to come be with them because they're not big mm-hmm. numbers, you know. Yep. Uh, so I wanted to mention today since we had y'all on, um, was it April? Uh-huh. So in April, April 19th, April 19th, uh, <clears throat> mom and Lisa have a new book uh, that's going to be coming out. And we're going to talk about uh, dad's books, too, in a minute. But I want you all to start with y'all's. And uh, it's it's called Sister Roar. Sister Roar. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Roar. So I want you <laughs> so I want you to tell us a little bit about tell our audience a little bit about the book. We're not it's not ready to sell them yet, so we're still a while ways out on that. Yeah. And when that gets closer, we'll let you you guys know and understand nation what to do to get one. But I just wanted to tease a little bit and to hear what you guys are doing because the manuscript is finished now. Mm-hmm. And so tell us a little bit about the book, kind of what you're trying to So this to is say. a mother and mother in law that you've sat down with. Mm-hmm. You so you and your mother in law come up. Who who dreamed this up? Uh, I was probably yeah, the Lisa. driving force, uh-huh. but um. So what's the topic? The topic is um. Beware of the Robertson s- clan. Nope, no, <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> well, that's just that's another book. <laughs> that's that's just a teacher it. book. <laughs> um, our book is for women, and it talks mm-hmm. to women, but it but we're never down on men. We do not hate men in the Mm -hmm. book. We love our men. Um, It's about sisterhood. It's about community. Um, It's about having groups together and opening yourself up, um, confessing sin, being healed of that sin, being able to help other women with the sin, you know, that you were healed from. Um, With the pandemic, it forced everybody inside isolation and I have seen and and Kay has seen with women that that isolation um, was not good for them because during that isolation is when Satan began to work his magic on them because they had nobody to talk to. And look, I mean, quite frankly, all they're Mm -hmm. watching is the news and we don't get any good news from the TV, you know? 
And so, and people weren't able to go to church. They weren't able to meet with their brothers and sisters. Um, and so too much isolation is not good for a person. And especially um, when there's fear from the pandemic, oh, people are going to get this and everybody's going to die. I mean, you know, it's just, I'm not down on news, but I am down on news because they never tell us anything good. They only tell us the bad things. Um, and so in order to get that encouragement, um, you need to fellowship with your sisters, with your brothers, with um, people who can share that wisdom with you and teach you how to be a better person, how to be a better mother, how to be a better wife, how to be a better sister, um, teach you, you know, how it's, it's the Titus passage, you know, it's the older women teaching younger women, but you know, in some cases it's younger women teaching older women because, um, these women have lived with these problems their whole life and, and they've not ever been able to um, give them to the Lord. They're, they've not ever been able to forgive themselves enough um, to get past them and to be able to share them with other people. I was so, in a hang, hang on, hang on, let's take a break. So one of my uh, favorite groups, organizations in all the world uh, is sponsoring the podcast right now, and it's it's called Samaritan's Purse. And uh, this group was started uh, by Franklin Graham uh, and his family, and they have helped so much. They've they've come here to West Monroe on two different occasions. We've had flooding. They set up right on our WFR parking lot and then went out and helped people like you wouldn't believe. I mean, they show up. So, you know, you look and you say, when well, a disaster happens, who's going to show up first? Groups like this. I've always said that when you see them coming, the orange shirts have arrived. That's exactly right. Good news. So they've been helping people for over 50 years, poverty, war, famine, persecution, natural disasters. We've experienced it ourselves. I cannot say enough about this group and what they're doing. Uh, I've spoken to their volunteers. They're incredible. And so here's what we need you to do. Go to SamaritansPurse.org slash unashamed and find out how you can get involved with this ministry because they're reliant on volunteers from all around the country. There are great testimonies of what God is doing. There's great opportunities to get involved. If you've been looking to volunteer, this is a place you can connect to. SamaritansPurse.org slash unashamed. Learn more on how you can be a part of this fantastic ministry. I was in a generation raised up where you did, you, it was all a secret. Yeah. Nobody, they were ashamed of anything happening, so nobody knew it. So they had to just deal with their self. Yeah. And then you just never wanted to know. The last place you'd want to tell is in the church. Yeah. Oh, heaven forbid you confess something. Right. There, it was more like the perfect people were there. Say that was all wrong. Mm -hmm. The church is the place for sinners, for people to come to and be loved, but even though they've been through all this bad stuff. And you can talk about it and people still love you. We always say in our, I'm, I'm a part of two different women groups. And one is uh, one with the recovery women, which are going through things. And then the other is just women who've been Christians a long time, but they still want to be together, have relationships, and even confess to each other or talk about it or just uplift and everything like that. And uh, and you're just not, it's, it's, we, our motto is we're unoffendable, and teachable because even to my day as old as i am i will be learning something to the day they put me in the grave mm -hmm. or or i quit talking then phil might be happy <laughs> but uh, no let her rip <clears throat> yeah because you can turn it off can't you so one thing i, I thought i thought was interesting is that you two wrote the book together and his dad said it was you know the matriarch of our family with now lisa who is her own matriarch you know, being yeah. a grandmother and Sadie is writing the forward mm -hmm. for the book, which is another layer generation. Yeah, well, yes. And, and again, uh, what I find fascinating about Sadie is that she has had an impact on her peers and now teenage girls after her mm -hmm. in a huge way. Yeah. But now she's a, a wife and a mother. Yes. And so she's experiencing all that. And so she's actually taking that and, and then yeah. passing those experiences on to this group of people that yeah. she's inspired. 
And so I thought that was really interesting that we were talking about a third generation yeah. book, really, right, being put forward as this. So it's called Roar. So t- tell me a little bit in the intro and the. It's early- called Roar, Sister Roar, Sister Roar. Because <laughs> I was thinking women, strange creatures. <laughs> Nope, that's not. That's the what name he would have named it. Huh? <laughs> I would have named it, <laughs> which, oh, which is why you need. Yeah, a we're going to talk about strange it's catchy creatures. And, 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 <laughs> no, and, nobody would be strange looking like you, would they? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Heaven forbid. I'm so normal. I seem abnormal. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about this concept of roar, because you talk about a lioness. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a pride <laughs> of lions, Dad. That's a you know, group of lions is a pride of lions. And you talk about this idea about the the lioness and the roar and what that means. Because we think of roar, we think of like the male lion. Yeah. But really, there's more to it than that, right? So tell us about kind of how that led into the book. Well, the lioness will roar loudly um, whenever there's danger around. Mm-hmm. So she does that to protect the pride, too, you know, just right. so they know. But she also does that to let her um, cubs know where she is. And then she does it out of out of love, you know, right. and then protection and Protect- protection. And, and to what we think of as humans as a scary sound to a lion, it's yeah. a sound of look out. You know, right. there, there's danger. There's, you yep. know, which is really interesting because well, it's think, the same with a family. Right. Yeah. As mothers, I think we do that, too. I mean, we have a voice that our kids know, um, and they know what that particular sound means. Um, they know our loving voice. They know our mad voice. They know our get out of the way of that car voice. I mean, we're the same way. You know, we use our voice to protect and to warn and, you know, to call our kids to the dinner table. Um, but so many times, um, with women, whenever they go through different things, um, they lose that voice because they feel as though I've done all of these things. And I know this is how I felt um, with being, you know, we talked about this before with me being a preacher's wife. I never felt worthy to be a preacher's wife because I thought, you know, I've done all these things and I've got this past. And and I mean, I'm not worthy to to do that job, to have that title. Um But sometimes we lose that voice because we allow Satan. His voice is so loud in our ear that that we don't speak. We don't say anything. We don't tell people the great and miraculous things that God has done in our life because Satan is right here on our shoulder and he's talking to us and he's saying, nobody wants to hear that. Nobody's going to respect you if you say that. You don't have a voice. You remember all the things that you've done in your life. And that is not true. Once we are um, saved by Jesus Christ, we have a voice. And all of the things that I have went through in my life and all the terrible things that I've done, Christ redeemed that. And he has picked me up and he put me on solid ground. He put me right smack dab in the middle of this family, I think which was exactly where he knew I needed to be. Um, He gave me UK as a voice whenever I was younger that, you know, was trying to tell me the way to treat my husband, raise my kids, be a good sister in Christ, study God's word. I mean, all those things that you taught me. Um, But the whole time Satan is saying, you don't have a voice. You've Mm -hmm. done all these things. It's not true. Once we are daughters of the Almighty, we have a voice. We inherit everything. Everything that God has is ours. Mm. And we have eternal life. There's n- Nobody can take that away from us. No matter how bad they make us feel, no matter what they do to us, kind of like with feels uncanceled, you cannot cancel us because we are um, daughters of the Almighty. You know, I'd like to say uh, the first time... They asked me to speak after, uh, you know, I became a Christian and Phil became a Christian. And then all of a sudden, somebody asked me to come to Ruston to a church and give my talk. And and so the first time I got up there, I remember it like it was yesterday. I just stood there. Yeah. <laughs> I just stood there looking at them. I couldn't open my mouth. I just kind of felt dry mouth. I felt everything. I just thought, 
I can't do this. Because Phil will tell you, anything over two syllables, now I'm gone. I can't say that. It will not come out right. And I can turn words into other words so quickly. It's like she said the other day. She said, well, I, I trip and fit, but at least I still have my facilities. I said, <laughs> you still have your facilities. I said, you mean your faculties? <laughs> she said, well, same thing. <laughs> well, look how close not, those not words are together. Thing, but it is a facility. Let's, yeah. uh, let's take a break. So we talk a lot on the podcast, Dad, about trees. Trees are a big part of our daily life with our property, with, you know, what what they're producing, what what's going to eat things that are coming off the trees. Do we cut trees? Do we move trees? Right now we're moving dead trees, of trees that have fallen. I mean, trees are a big part of our regime, wouldn't you say? Oh, right in the smack dab middle of everything. So <clears throat> the one unique thing about this is you don't have to just have a bunch of hunting property to deal with trees. Uh, Lisa and I ordered some trees from uh, one of our sponsors, and it's a company called Fast Growing Trees, because we wanted to plant some trees around our property in our landscaping. And so we ordered them. They came. They were in great shape. They were ready to put in the ground. Uh, They call it their 30-day alive and thrive guarantee, which means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. So over a million satisfied gardeners have have found out what we found out from fastgrowingtrees.com. So right now, through November 30th, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson, and you're going to get 15% off your first order. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson, fastgrowingtrees.com slash Robertson. Get you some fast growing trees. And it's a good month to start, mid-October. Perfect. October, November, plant trees in the fall. You heard it here. Well, I wanted to read this. Uh, I thought this was a really good excerpt from uh, early in the book, um, which kind of speaks to the idea of sisterhood that you guys are talking about in most throughout the whole book. And you have a lot of times where you reference women of the Bible and where you see that, you know, mm-hmm. that roar and that sisterhood being, mm-hmm. being expressed. One of our favorite things about a roar is how it can serve as an invitation a chance to let yourself be known. Great relationships start with making yourself available. And I would say you both are great examples of being available. Your roar is something you'll discover deep within and express in your own special way. Others may hear it or see it in tangible ways, but most of the time they'll perceive it with their own hearts. And I love this statement. Healthy community will be born when you express your roar and hear the roar of others. And so that's that idea about sisterhood. And sometimes it has to have a platform to be able to do that. But to have a platform, you have to have an availability, which is to offer yourself for others. We talked about this in the last podcast, Dad and I, about because we were talking about the when Jesus fed the thousands of people with the fish, and then how our house <clears throat> growing up was always a house of hospitality mm-hmm. and availability. And Lisa and I have the same house now. I mean, we learned it from you guys, mm-hmm. and now we express it on forward. And I see my kids doing the same thing. Yeah. That's exactly right. What I was going to finish my story a while ago that you didn't let me finish. I didn't know. Well, <laughs> no, was I was going to tell you when I couldn't speak, the one, a woman who invited me walked up there and whispered in my ear, and she said, Miss Kay, all we want you to do, hadn't God done a lot of stuff for you? You know, and she knew about the 10 years, you know, he was so bad. And, uh, you know, it just all of a sudden it clicked. She said, tell your story. Mm-hmm. Tell your testimony. Nobody can do that but you. Right. And when she told me that, it was like the power of God just came in me, and I said, oh, I have a story to tell. For all of you <laughs> that think God can't rescue you, let me mm-hmm. tell you something. For 10 years, I lived with a man who was terrible. I mean, he did every sinful thing you can think of and didn't care who saw it. But everybody said, leave him, leave him, leave him. Even both families, his family, my family. But you know what? I said, nope. My grandma said, when you're married, it's a vow you take for life, and you don't do that. So I had nobody on my side, no. and yet I stayed. Right. Yeah. And and look at it now. Yeah. yeah. Are you glad? Yeah, we're all glad. Yeah. What about Dad? I'm, I'm very glad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say, Alan was talking about the women in the Bible. I mean— 
because you take a woman like the woman at the well yep. who meets Jesus at the well. Mm -hmm. And of course, not supposed to be talking to him anyway, but she's there in the heat of the day. And you have to wonder why was she there in the heat of the day? Well, because she didn't want to go and all the other women That's did right. because they knew what her life was like. Yeah, her roar was muted by her past. That's exactly right. Because right. Jesus brought that out, right? She's been married five times. She's living mm -hmm. with a guy now. That's not her husband. Right. right. But but once she met Jesus and knew who he was and accepted mm -hmm. that and accepted his healing, yeah. she goes back into the town and she's not quiet anymore. That's right. She has a roar and she goes out and tells everybody, I mean, Jesus Jesus told me everything I've ever done, which was not absolutely the true, but I mean, for her it was because but the she only told thing the she, worst thing she had. That's exactly right. right. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. To her, that was her life. That's right. Those those five people that she was divorced from and then living with somebody that wasn't. That was that was her life. So well, she's and, already a Samaritan which would put her from an Israel situation is outside the camp. Yeah. Then on top of that, you've, you've been married right. all these times and divorced. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't get any lower from their and perspective. And the one she was yeah. living with, she wasn't even married to. That's right. right. She was just right. shacked up. So she goes back into the town and tells everybody, and it says after a, a lot of people were, were converted. Many and believed. Many believed. And then afterwards, they said it wasn't just by what you said. Yeah. It was because we listened to him too. But just think of that. She had to go and tell them what happened, and then they came to hear what Jesus had to say. That's right. And so it doesn't matter what your life is like. Like Kay said, everybody has a story, and only you can tell your story. And everybody has a story where God has redeemed you um, from a past. Yeah, and and if, if you don't tell it, then how can you ever say he works? Because when they see, you know, my miracle— over here, you know, they'll say, and then that much later, Phil's just preaching, 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 and preaching, and they'll say, no, that's not the guy that hung out in the bars. That's not the guy that was mean to you. That's not the guy that wrecked four vehicles and all that kind of stuff. That's they not the man. At, that that the repentant one. Yes. That's right. Yeah, right. And then they saw him, and not <laughs> only was he just repentant, did good, but then his voice started. And it never stopped, and it won't till he's dead. Right. Yeah, it became John the Baptist. Well, I've changed my mind. I think the old whoever the philosopher was, Al, who said a situation becomes a crisis <laughs> when cattle or women stampede. I've changed my mind about that. You need good women. You need a stampede of godly women. <laughs> That's right. Turn like loose it. on America. All right. We've, we've, we've moved ad. We moved the needle today <laughs> by y'all's appearance. Yep. Yeah. And that's, to me, that's the heart of the story. And you're right. It was all the example. The biblical examples are good. You guys are both very upfront and real about your own struggles and past. And I think that's what allows people to tell their story. You know, when, when they see real people. So. Y'all are famous, by the way, both of you. You're famous for hospitality. Yeah. Well, I know something Which is else. a really good thing. Let's take our last break, Mom. I know something else. I'm funny. <laughs> and you can turn, <laughs> you and you and your daughter-in-law can turn anything into a, 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 a gigantic Feed, a gigantic <laughs> celebration. That's but I think yeah. it doesn't take you, much, and you no. don't celebrate it. That's mm -hmm. right. We cook mm -hmm. it and we do it. But I think this thing I was trying to tell you about being funny is so many times everybody's easily offended. Oh, he said that. Oh, like we will start a fuss. Somebody, one of us will disagree, and then all of a sudden I'll say something really funny, or Phil will, and then we bust out laughing. Well, you can't be mad after that. You're not going to laugh. Mm -hmm. But I think so many people need to have a, they don't have a sense of humor. Phil will always say they need to get go to Walmart and buy one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it would avoid so much trouble if you just learn how to right. laugh. Yeah. America needs to laugh more. Yep. And yeah. marriages do. That's right. Well, I mean, we, um, there for a while, we had a lot of laughter whenever I was falling down all the time. Oh, yeah. But I guess I, I don't know what happened. I guess the Lord healed me well, from that, too, no, but from the we, falling down. We well, I'm still laugh. falling down. <laughs> when, when Lisa and I were first married, I mean, she had a roar 
but it wasn't necessarily the the godly roar. You know, right. it was it was a roar. But I think what God has done through the years is the things that she didn't ever think she could accomplish by being God's woman. She's done. And so one of my great blessings that I get tonight will be up in a little town about an hour north of here. And we're speaking on behalf of a pregnancy center to raise some funds for them. And I get a chance to open up, talk about the family and, you know, kind of get everybody laughing a little bit. And then I just step back and then Lisa goes into her story. And I, it's always amazing because I get to watch the audience, you know, when someone else is speaking, which you don't normally get to do because usually you're in the audience. And I watch those faces. I can see them where they're hurting and they just don't, hadn't had anybody. And you, you can just see it in their faces. And so I see you, that roar every time we get up and we speak to audiences because she's just very raw and very real yep. about what God has done in her life. And so I see the impact of that. So you know, our prayer always is that those folks can find that pride, yep. can mm-hmm. find that sisterhood, can find that group, you know, because you need community. Yeah. Which is kind of, I think, the heart of the book, wouldn't you say? Right. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, for mm-hmm. me going through it. So yeah. I've been a part of this book, as I am with all the books in the family. I, I'm not a publicist or a publisher, but, but I should. But you play one on I Twitter. should be. That's as many as I've helped get through. <laughs> and so in our last few minutes here together, uh, you, you guys' book coming out, Dad has two books out now. One of them we have mentioned is the C-plus Gospel series. And this is kind of uniquely for you guys, for Unashamed Nation. It's a resource. Uh, we started a uh, 501c3, which is a basically a nonprofit. And we did that so we could help preach the gospel to as many people as possible. So mom and dad started that with Ben and Melissa, my cousins. And this book is the first of a series that we're using just to get into people's hands to understand what the gospel is. So every one of you that buy one of these books, all the money that goes to that is all nonprofit to be able to share the gospel. So mm-hmm. I want to make you aware of that one. It's excellent. And then this one, which is your daily feel, which is the devotional book. It's a hundred days of truth and freedom uh, to heal America's soul. And so there's some excerpts taken from um, theft of America's soul and Jesus politics. And then we've just come up with some questions and a way just to be able to kind of have a connect with God. And mainly this book's purpose is to help us try to make a difference in our culture. When you say so, Dad, I mean, yeah. it's a personal upbuilding, but the idea mm-hmm. is so that I can be relevant, you know, in our culture. So this book had been exclusive in Walmart, and now uh, it's about to go nationwide with all distributors. So be looking for that if you hadn't had a chance to get it. I know Walmart's been out for a while, several Walmarts. So be looking for that. It's going to be coming up. And then Dad's got a new book coming out February. I think it's the first Tuesday in February. I think it's February 8th, maybe. But anyway, it's early February. It's called Uncanceled. And so, Dad, tell us just a little bit about that. We're we're getting pretty close. It, it won't be long before we ask you guys to do some pre-orders. We're not quite there yet, just so we can get it up, moved up the list. Basically, in a, in a, in a Bible text, I'll make it easier for our audience. Uh, when you, when you, when we click on. You have no excuse, Romans chapter 2. No one has an excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else. You say, I have no excuse when I pass judgment on someone. (laughs) Meaning they've sinned and I will carry that. And that sin, and I will never forgive them the rest of my life on the earth. So you who pass judgment on someone else, I hate this individual or that one for sinning or doing this or doing that. For at whatever point you judge the other, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. (laughs) You're like, boy. So the book is about, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So you, a mere man or woman, pass judgment on someone else and yet do the same things? Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? Mm. Be forgiving. Yeah. Whatever you do, and don't blame others for one mistake right. that you will never forget forever. Right. 
And Which is really it's a I, horrible way to live, and America is caught up in it in uh, a big way. And we and we've said this before on the podcast. Dad was one of the early people that was that was people attempted to cancel you. That is the correct. idea that, and this was even built on a misperception. But the idea is is that you are something that you're not. Therefore, we're going to decide that you have no voice anymore in our yep. culture in America. And now we see it's just rampant, as you said. And most of it comes from an ability not to be able to forgive. Or You know, somebody say, hey, I was wrong about that. You know, you mentioned Gruden last time. You know, 10 years ago, I, I did an email. I shouldn't have probably done that. That was a little bit. I didn't expect that to get out, but it did. I'm sorry about that, which is what he did. But instead of saying, okay, we get it. People make mistakes. No. They just kept on till he had to just quit. That's, That's why the ability to confess your sins before God and be healed is a wonderful thing. It is. So the ver- if we're going to take his forgiveness, you must have forgiveness of your own right. toward others, which is a hard lesson. The for passage you. that I love that's also one of the cores of Uncanceled is, is Colossians 2.13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, yep. having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Woo. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So if your sins have been canceled and the law that has held you by this power of sin and death is that's been removed and, and nailed to the cross, that's all the cancel we need. I right. guarantee you. As you go forward, it doesn't matter what someone else says about you. Ephesians 4.32, I believe, is what the verse is. And it says, be kind and compassionate, forgiving others their sins. Right. So, I mean... So God considers you being, whenever you're kind and compassionate, that means you're forgiving other people. Right. That's exactly right. So cancel culture says we'll hold that against right. you yeah. the rest of your mm-hmm. life on earth. We will never forgive you. Right. It's a sad and a sorry state that, of affairs. Which, which ultimately means that they probably have a problem accepting yep. forgiveness themselves. That is correct. So therefore they can't pass it on. They I'm just trying pass to along. show them. Why don't you just yeah. love God and love your neighbor? And they Call, never have peace. If God says peace. something is sin, believe it. It is sin. Yeah. So just turn from it. Love God, and you can be cleansed, and let's go. I said the, the thing that would fix America, that would totally take away all our ills, is a big dose of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. That's it. If you could just embrace it and pass it on. That's what yeah. that's what Uncancel is that's all about. That's what the about. book is all about. Yeah. So we got a lot of cool things. Sister Roar be looking for that. Uncancel be looking for mm-hmm. that. And the other things we talked about. It's always good to have the female perspective of the Robertson mm-hmm. matriarchs on our Oh, and podcast. I have another announcement. I don't know if I've told Kay this or not. Um, I will be speaking at the March for Life in Washington, right. D.C. in January. Wow. Like yeah. the million people show up. I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. So we're yeah. super excited. So yeah. we thank the ones that invite us. This is going to be the end yeah. of January. So uh, yeah. if you're up in that 21st, area, we'd yeah. love to see you, Unashamed Nation, come to the big march. And uh, Lisa will be doing her little three minute speech. You're going to have to work on that. That's, I know. It's hard to do a three minute speech. <laughs> three to five? <laughs> three to five minutes. Not a lot of time. Got a lot of people going through there. Long way to go for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to say one more thing. All right, you close us out, Mom. I'm telling you, it's hard to shut them up, Al. <laughs> yeah, it Rock is. on. This is where we started. <laughs> okay, uh, I just want to say that, Alan, from you being a little bitty boy at three years old, Loving the Dallas Cowboys. Yep. They won that game. Oh, that's right. We never got a chance to talk about football. We'll do hey. that next time. You notice I broke my cowboy hat back out. I know. It's been a few years in hibernation. I was just, I couldn't stay in my seat. <laughs> yeah. you... I called mom last night. This shows you what mom is about football now. I called her last night and I said, Mom, I said, we were talking about a meal today. And she said, well, I'll have to wait till halftime to check on that because I'm just too into this game. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I got it. And Phil goes to bed before it's over. Yeah. Who and does an, that? Another exciting year. She said, you're not going to bed before the ball game, Joe. I said, yeah. I said, tell, I me, s- tell me about it tomorrow. So she had a note. She said, unbelievable. The Titans came back and won. And I went in there and stood over his bed, and I wanted to tell him, and he was just snoring. I couldn't do it. <laughs> all right, we'll tell more football next time. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. 
And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.